This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform which allows entrepreneurs to create and customise their own personal or professional website. More on Squarespace later in the video. So hello and welcome to another episode of Geographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood. That's Carl with a K, Smallwood with a small followed by a wood. Yes, I know, it's very funny. Let's move on. And today we're talking about K2, the Savage Mountain. And I'd like to point out before we go any further, I'm very, very unwell. I've been bedridden for the last few days. So if I look paler and sicklier than usual, it's not because I'm British, it's because I'm ill and I'm British. Glad we got out of the way. Let's move on. Today's video is based on a script written by James CJ. Give them a follow on the social media links you can find below. Deep in the Himalayas on the border of China and Pakistan lies one of the deadliest mountains in the world. K2. This mountain, part of the Karakoram range, is the second tallest mountain in the world, only beaten by Mount Everest. But unlike Everest, K2 isn't crawling with tourists or covered in corpses and poop. And that's because it's considered one of the deadliest treks that the Himalayas has to offer. While there have been far fewer attempts to climb K2 than other mountains in the Himalayas, the death rate in comparison solidifies its deadly title. The ratio of deaths to ascent is a grim 1 to 6. You would quite literally have the same odds of survival playing Russian roulette. Its location is partly why it's a far less frequented mountain. Pakistan is more challenging to enter than Nepal, which hosts mountains like Everest and the Annapurna Massif. Despite this mountain's deadly reputation and the very difficult process to get to it, it's still a challenge many mountaineers seek to try, which isn't truly surprising considering the popularity of mountain climbing in the Himalayas. Now right away, K2 might seem like a pretty strange name for a mountain, it's nowhere near as immediately recognisable as, say, Everest or Annapurna, or one of the many other mountain massifs in the Himalayas. K2's interesting name is because, as mentioned, it's in the Karakoram range on the border of China and Pakistan, just northeast of the Himalayas. In 1802, a project known as the Great Trigonometrical Survey was conducted to map out the entire Indian subcontinent with precision to demarcate British territory in India and, of course, the Himalayas. When surveyors from British India surveyed the mountains in the region, they were all named K and then a number. K1, K2, K3 and when the mountains started being named proper, K2's isolated nature made it kind of difficult because no local community was nearby enough to agree upon a name, which is fair considering the closest village to K2 is 120 kilometers away. Mount Goodwin Austin was suggested as a potential name in honor of an earlier explorer in the area, Henry Goodwin Austin. Ultimately though, the Royal Geographical Society just rejected it, and as a result, K2's name stuck and is entirely circumstantial. Despite the official name of K2, this dangerous mountain has many nicknames. Locally, K2 is called Datsang or Chogori, which loosely translates to variations of Big Mountain Peak, King of Mountains, Savage Mountain, The Mountaineer's Mountain, and The Mountain of Mountains. So just several variations of Big Ass Mountain. As noted, K2 straddles the border of Pakistan and China, meaning it's in two different countries at once, both of which are fairly difficult for tourists to navigate. K2's position in Pakistan places it in the Baltistan region of Gilgit Baltistan. Meanwhile, in China, it's in the Tax Korgan Taijik Autonomous County of Xinjiang. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? All major climbing routes for K2 lie on the Pakistani side of the mountain. Climbers usually use the Abruzzi Spur as a well established option that, despite its difficulty, does offer the highest chance of success. Remember, close to one in six. This route takes climbers along a series of levels named House's Chimney, the Black Pyramid, the Shoulder, and finally, the appropriately named the Bottleneck, before leading out to the Abruzzi Ridge, which is what separates climbers from K2 Summit. It's also one of the most difficult vertical climbs in the Himalayas, if not the entire world. Despite the known dangers of K2, a fair number of people have actually managed to conquer the mountain. As of 2021, it's estimated that around 700 people have summited the second tallest mountain in the world, behind Everest. This is of course a far cry from the 6,500 who have summited Everest, but considering how harsh K2 is in comparison, it makes sense that the numbers wouldn't be close. As mentioned, K2 has a death rate higher than that of its Himalayan counterparts, even if this number has admittedly dropped in recent years from the low 20% range to nearly 13%. So better, but still not great. This is largely due to more successful summits in recent years, like 2022 producing 190 successful summits, which beat the previous record of 62 in 2018. 
growing. Considering the growing number of people flocking to K2 every year, it's a question of how long this pathway to K2 summit before it starts showing signs of deterioration. Because yeah, the, the dirty secret, a literal dirty secret of mountain climbing is that so much mountain climbing involves just being an arse and leaving behind like rubbish and poop. And in some cases, your own corpse, but more on that later. American climber George Bell probably said it best when talking about K2, saying, and I quote, it's a savage mountain that tries to kill you. But what is it about this mountain that's so dangerous? Well, it's not one particular thing, but a combination of several things that lend to its dangerous status. For starters, you've got the shape of the mountain itself. K2 is a pyramid-shaped mountain, which probably has you thinking, well, aren't all mountains pyramid-shaped? Yeah, but it's specifically how pyramid shape K2 is that causes issues because unlike a lot of the other 8,000 mountains, like, you know, despite being 244 meters lower than Everest, its topographical features are far more challenging, which in combination with external factors make it extremely difficult to conquer in comparison. For example, while Everest is steep and certainly much taller, it has numerous stretches of far flatter terrain, allowing for traveling along the mountainside and stopping for a rest and so forth. On the other hand, K2 is nearly void of any flattened out areas whatsoever. And in areas where it does slightly flatten out, it doesn't do for long. The area known as the shoulder is also prone to avalanches and rock fall. It's located in a zone aptly titled the death zone, about 25,000 feet, just in case that didn't sound dangerous enough. The, the lack of climbable routes also hinders climbers, with the Abruzzi Spur being the only real sensible option. The east face of K2 hasn't been climbed due to the instability of ice and snow on that side of the mountain. The north ridge route was used in 2007 for a summit, but has rarely been used since due to deteriorating conditions and frequent avalanches. So, yeah. The North Ridge access to K2 lies on the Chinese side of the mountain, which is difficult to access in of itself due to needing to cross the Shaxgam River, a particular river that is known for rising water levels, making it near impossible to cross almost the entire year. Then it's back to the weather, which on K2 is highly unpredictable, often unforgiving, and produces frequent storms, strong winds, and avalanches. Currently, climbers seem to enjoy far more success with the summit of K2, but that doesn't mean there are no longer concerns for anyone looking to conquer this particularly dangerous trek. So I'm sure whatever I'm interrupting was very, very interesting, but it's time for a word from our sponsors, which means I need help from my anteater. It, we've never got that right. <laughs> So I am joined, as always, by two members of the ad team, Brad and Nisha, to talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. So, Nisha, tell me more about today's sponsor. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform used to create beautiful websites. Uh, it'll, it'll never stop being funny, like it's a website that makes websites. And it's great to know that you can use it to blog, engage with your audience, sell products, content, time, or advertise your business. Yes, because there's pretty much everyone needs a website these days. And if you sat at home thinking, well, I don't need a website, do you have a social media profile? That's a website, but it's a website on a platform that you can't customize. And I think it's great that you can keep in contact with people who subscribe by setting up email campaigns. Which is an incredibly underrated feature because we're recording this and uploading it to YouTube and we can't tell you how difficult it is to get the content people subscribe to see in front of their eyeballs. Squarespace makes that easier with the ability to directly contact them. And one of the things that you can email your subscribers about is if you do an online course. Again, another underrated feature of the ability to like, charge people for your time and expertise. That's not something that's easy to do in this day and age. And one of the bonuses about the online course is you can charge a one-time fee or set up a subscription, which I think is it's really good to have that versatility. So thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics. And to save 10% on your first purchase of a website slash domain, use the code geographics. So would you guys like to hear a bonus fact about jeans? Yay! The story here is that you realistically will never need to wash a pair of denim jeans. And multiple studies have shown that the level of bacteria buildup after two weeks never really changes. And the level of bacteria after those two weeks is a safe, acceptable level. Many jeans manufacturers specifically advise customers not to wash their jeans, with the CEO of Levi's once sheepishly admitting on stage that their favorite pair had not been washed in 10 years. The 
The first serious attempt to climb K2 occurred in 1902 when Alistair Crowley and Oscar Eckenstein led an expedition with several other climbers to conquer it. Unlike most of the expedition party, Crowley was not a dedicated climber. He was a philosopher, an artist, a novelist, and a ceremonial magician. And also, apparently, the final boss of the PlayStation 1 game, Nightmare Creatures. You know, the one with the weird gangly wolves that were like, rawr, rawr. I like that game. Oscar Eckenstein, on the other hand, was an experienced English mountaineer and rock climber who pioneered the sport of bouldering. You know, that thing everyone on Tinder does now. By this point, nobody had dared to assail K2. The five mountaineers that made up the Crowley Eckenstein expedition were hoping to be the first. On April 28, 1902, they began their journey into the mountain on their way to K2. The journey to the base of K2 was by no means easy. It took 14 days just to get to the bottom of the mountain, facing harsh weather conditions the entire way. Eventually, they reached the untested mountain and began the first attempts known to man to summit K2. While not entirely laid out, the timeline of events claims that for months they prepared to summit K2 by determining ascent paths and base camps while waiting for more favourable weather conditions, making incremental slow progress up the mountain. Of course, this didn't entirely work out in their favour. For starters, a blizzard delayed them until June 27th, 1902, then snow fell relentlessly from July 2nd through 6th, further delaying their ascent up the mountain due to safety concerns. To make matters worse, numerous people were beginning to fall ill, Crowley even contracting malaria on July 12th. By all measures, things were not going well. Another climber encountered a far more serious condition just above the 6,400 meter mark when they were setting up Camp 12. He had a buildup of fluid in both lungs, which I can relate to right now. I've got that like that crackly chest on the go. Like, you know, I'm doing my uh, best impression of uh, my favorite knockoff Bond villain, just Ivor Chestikov. It's like, whoo. The efforts to recover the climate and get him to safety meant they missed a two-day window that would have allowed them to make it to the top of K2, which annoyed Crowley greatly. Which makes sense, yeah? They would have literally made history. Shortly after taking the alien climate to safety, the weather began to deteriorate yet again. By August 1st, it was an intense blizzard. Despite not reaching the summit of K2, the expedition broke every altitude endurance record to exist at the time. And it gave them a title of being the first team to attempt K2, even if they weren't the first team to manage it. The first successful summit would take more than five Five decades. So considering everything, the attempt made in 1902 was far from a failure, making it 6,525 meters up the mountain. Following the first attempt, more attempts were made to conquer the mountain. However, they were few and often far between. The next attempt happened in 1909, led by Prince Luigi Amadeo, Duke of the Abruzzi. His expedition reached 6,251 meters and accessed the mountain using the Southeast Spur, now known as the aforementioned Abruzzi Spur, the standard route today. They abandoned the original path after determining it was too steep and challenging for anyone to conquer. Eventually, after not locating a suitable alternative, they just abandoned the expedition altogether. While they got no further than Crowley's expedition, 6,251 meters versus their 6,525, their journey arguably had more impact. They literally just defined the route that everyone else would take after them. Three years after their K2 summit attempt, Prince Amadeo and Filippi Di Filippi, just let that sit for a second, that's that's a cool name. The expedition doctor wrote and published a book detailing the expedition, providing breathtaking pictures and maps of the region. These resources would become invaluable to future expedition attempts. In 1938, Charles Houston led the first American expedition to explore the Karakoram and eventually summit K2. This expedition reached 7,925 meters via the Abruzzi Spur, but ultimately didn't make it due to low supplies and the threat of bad weather, always a risk high up a mountain. The next American attempt would come the following year, but it would be the first deadly run at climbing K2. So it was record-breaking, though not for the reasons that they anticipated. In 1939, another group of American climbers took another crack at K2. However, this team, led by Fritz Weissner, had a far different experience than the 1938 expedition. Like prior attempts, Fritz and his expedition attempted to summit K2 via the Abruzzi Spur. However, they made numerous missteps along the way, and one resulted in a climber being left stranded near the top of the mountain. Dudley Wolf was among the more eager climbers on the journey. Still, he was far from the most experienced or gifted of climbers. When faced with waist-deep snow at 25,300 feet, Dudley had no real choice but to return to Camp 8 alone, while Fritz and a Sherpa pushed on. His inability to continue was the result of bad eyesight and a poor sense of balance, and in general, he was handicapped by being not a very good climber. So the fact he made it 25,000 feet up is still quite impressive. They sent for three Sherpas to retrieve him. However, they only managed to reach him after Wolf spent a week alone at 24,000 
thousand feet. When they got to Dudley, he refused to descend for unknown reasons. It's possible that by that point he'd been broken a bit mentally, as it was recorded that he hadn't gone outside much during the week, even going to the toilet in his tent. All of these mountains are covered in poop. A few days later, on July 31st, the three Sherpas made a third attempt to get Dudley, which failed due to the Sherpas and Dudley just disappearing. Finally, a fourth attempt was planned, but soon abandoned, and it was assumed that all four climbers had perished and were lost to the mountain. Dudley and the missing Sherpa were never seen again. As far as disasters go, the 1939 expedition caused a lot of discord back home among climbers. The poor organisation and leadership of the expedition were on full display, with Fritz Weissner and Deputy Leader Tony Cromwell receiving the bulk of blame for the tragic failure of the expedition. It would take well over a decade for another attempt to be made that would conquer the Savage Mountain. Fifty-two years after Crowley and Eckenstein almost made it, an Italian expedition in 1954 finally conquered K2. Geologist Ardito Desio was the expedition organiser and eventual logistics manager. He was joined by seasoned climbers, get this, Achille Compagnoni and Lino Lassadelli. Just spectacularly Italian names. I'm very happy I get to say multiple times throughout this video with a sore throat and a splitting bloody headache. Anyway, with eight others to make up part of an 11 person expedition. While the successful summit wasn't questioned, what happened on the mountain was scrutinized for literally years when disputes among climbers challenged Desio's accounting of events. It wasn't until 2007, near half a century later, that the story of K2's first summit was finally confirmed and laid to rest. So let's tell it now. On April 2nd, 1954, the expedition of 11 climbers and more than 440 porters began carrying equipment to the base of the mountain. So that's like just another dirty secret of mountain climbing. Right? It's often like, you no, know, just portrayed as like, you know, one or two people conquering a mountain, like, you know, just man against nature. What you don't see is like, as in this case, the 500 or so people in the background actually just, you know, pushing them all the way up. Kind of sucks. It's like the whole thing with like, you know, the first person to to climb um, uh, Everest. And it was like, you know, it was a Sherpa Tenzing. Like it already climbed up it before. Like the guy had already been up it like twice or something like that, but it's just living. I don't even know. Remember the guy? I know. I know Sherpa Tenzing though. That guy's a don. Yeah. It's, so it's just one of those things I really hate about stories like this. It's always like it's always just just framed as like one person's achievement. It's like no, there were five hundred people helping you. Anyway, after months of travelling, they arrived at K2 and immediately began establishing a base camp on May 28th, 1954. They used the same path as prior expeditions, the Abruzzi Spur, going through the house's chimney, the Black Pyramid, the shoulder, the bottleneck, to reach the summit. The journey up the mountain wasn't without peril. Climber Maria Puchos died on June 21st due to excessive fluid in his lungs, something, as mentioned, other expeditions faced too. Among the issues was that they were behind schedule by about a month and the Sherpas they had weren't the most enthusiastic or experienced. Climbers were spread out across several camps, making up the mountain, acting as a support team for the lead climbers, La Cidelli and Compagnoni. When it came time for the final push to the summit, they needed more oxygen, so Pino Galotti and Walter Bonetti, again, two spectacularly Italian names, were sent to get more oxygen tanks from Camp 7, bring them back up to Camp 9 so that Compagnoni and La Cidelli could make the final stretch to the summit. Again, framed as two guys' achievement, but they're sending other people back up and down the mountain. They like Technically, those guys have climbed more. They didn't get as high, but they climbed more because they went all the way down and then came back up with more stuff. By the time they returned with the tanks, they struggled to find the tent where Compagnoni and Lassadelli were waiting. It took a few hours to find the two climbers' tent, but once they did, it was too late for them to descend, so they spent the night in the freezing cold temperatures high up on K2 and descended in the morning. At the same time, Compagnoni and Lassadelli weren't wasting any time in their attempt to reach the summit. As the sun came up, they were up and raring to go, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. They realised they'd need to take fewer things with them, so they each took a camera, extra film, a handful of sweets and their oxygen tanks. Sweets for Americans being candy, because it's very, very, like, you know, like, just calorie intensive um, climbing in sub-zero temperatures, so you need to eat like seven, 8,000 calories a day. It's ridiculous. Excessive snow made the shoulder difficult to get through. Still, they managed after hours of attempts and much of their oxygen supply was depleted. They continued up the mountain, finally discarding their empty oxygen tanks after running out. They realized they could breathe just fine, despite what the physiologists had warned them back in Italy. With the summit just a bit further away, they carried on, and it was on that day, July 31st, 1954, that the two managed to summit K2. All on their own, can you believe it? No one helped them, it was all them. The controversy though, if you're wondering, 
we mentioned some controversy, came when Compagnoni, who made claims against Bonetti that sought to discredit him and ruin his reputation. The claims that Bonetti had endangered the mission due to his reckless handling of the oxygen tanks. You know, the oxygen tanks that he went to get and that they just threw away. This wasn't true or backed up with any evidence, but Compagnoni had helped in the effort to discredit Bonetti. The club Alpino Italiano, just so many fun Italian words to say today, the officials behind the expedition helped cover up Compagnoni's actions which would have tarnished the expedition. Compagnoni had purposely moved the location of Camp 9, purposely so that Bonetti couldn't come to the summit with them. It was a selfish act of not wanting to share in the glory of summiting K2 by preventing a young climber from getting attention for the achievement. This resulted in a major back and forth where Bonetti took Compagnoni to court to clear his name, winning a defamation case in 1966. However, as mentioned, it would be five decades before they revised the official story and released Bonetti's version of events, finally clearing his name once and for all. So over the years, there have been three years in particular, 1986, 1996, and 2008, that have seen more deaths on K2 than any other. In 1986, the Pakistani government allowed several expeditions to proceed up the mountain simultaneously, most using similar routes, causing it to be one of the busiest periods the mountain had ever seen. The first major set of casualties happened between June 21st and August 4th. Now, it started with two American climbers who died during an avalanche on June 21st. Only one climber's body was ever recovered. On June 23rd, we saw Wanda Rutkowitz, the first woman to summit K2 along with five other French climbers. Unfortunately, the journey back down the mountain was quite treacherous. They made it through the night in an emergency shelter. Still, two climbers, married couple Liliana Marie Barard, disappeared during the descent the following morning. While Lillian's body was recovered three weeks later, it would be until 1998 when Maurice's body was found. Then you have a Polish climber who fell to his death after summiting K2 on July 10th, and then an Italian soloist who fell into a crevasse on July 16th. And he's just one of those dirty secrets about mountain climbing that they don't really tell you. And that is that a lot of big mountains are just covered in corpses. There's just so many frozen skeletons all over like big mountains. Like Everest, for example, has over like a hundred bodies, I believe, just littered on the mountain, which might make you wonder, why don't they just go up and get them? But like, right? And it's like, well, yeah, they try, but it's quite dangerous because obviously they died. So try and get the body could be equally as dangerous. So in a lot of cases, they just decide to leave the body there. And then, and here's the part that I find just so cruelly ironic. Those bodies oftentimes become waypoints for other climbers. So just other climbers can just judge how well they're doing by how far above the corpse they got. So those people's bodies just become just eternal testaments to their own failure. Like a yardstick against all other people will measure themselves while climbing the mountain, just getting endlessly, eternally dunked on. Moving back to K2 on July 28th, Julie Tulis, Kurt Deinberger, and four Austrians made their way to the Abruzzi Spur. Many things went wrong during this ascent, from overcrowding to the weather conditions, with a violent storm starting on August 5th that lasted for five days. By now, two people had already perished. One of the Polish climbers fell to his death, and a Porto suffered a stonefall. Motivation was, as you might expect, at an all-time low. Julie died on the 6th or the 7th. We don't really know. The reason is unknown. She was trapped at Camp 4 with several other climbers waiting for weather conditions to improve. By August 10th, the weather had improved enough that they were preparing for descent. Unfortunately, five people, including Julie Tulis, didn't make it back from that journey, and the exact cause of their deaths remains unknown and just speculation to this day. Then you have 1995, which saw seven climbers die between August 13th and August 15th, but the exact reasons for their deaths are unknown as they were lost in a storm on the mountain. The only death that isn't speculated about is UK climber Alison Hargreaves, who made it to the top of K2, but is suspected to have been simply blown off the summit by a strong wind. And I'm scared of heights. That sounds like just the worst thing ever. Because that's the most height you could ever be experiencing, like with the exception of Everest, which you could see from the top of K2. Like that is just the worst it could ever be. Of just, oh, look, I'm, hey, I'm literally at the top of the world. Again, could not be me. And all but one of these deaths happened on August 13th, with the other happening on August 15th due to exposure to the elements. Two climbers survived the storm at Camp 4, but suffered from severe frostbite and lost like fingers and toes and stuff. And I guess I kind of have to mention one of the most metal stories to have ever happened, and that is the, the story of Sir Ranulph Fiennes, a British explorer who's been all over the world. I think he's climbed Everest, he's been to the Arctic, and he got like severe frostbite in, I forget which of his hands, but it was like so severe that like, all the nerves had died. And normally they amputate 
you know, the frostbitten limb. But in his case, doctors told him, okay, so we need you to leave it because there might still be something we can save. And the longer you leave it, the more of like, you know, your fingers and hand will be able to save. And he basically had to sit at home just while he could feel his nerves dying and his bones melting within his own hand. And at some point he just went, you know what? Screw this. Got up, walked to his garden, put his own hand in a vice and cut off his remaining fingers with a hacksaw, drove to the hospital and asked them to fix it. Some people are built different. Moving on to 2008, there was yet another terrible disaster on K2 where 11 climbers died and three were fatally injured at various points of the journey near the treacherous bottleneck section of the ascent. Over two days, August 1st and 2nd, 10 different climbing groups were on K2. They've been waiting for good weather since early June, but it only came in late July, pushing their climbs into the early days of August. The groups included American, French, Norwegian, Serbian, and South Korean teams. Then there were Sherpas from porters from both Nepal and Pakistan. During the climb, there were numerous delays and missteps setting up the lines. The lead Sherpa, Shaheen Baig, the only one to have ever summited K2 before, had to step down and leave the mountain due to altitude sickness. And just Pro tip here, if you ever find yourself climbing a big mountain, if the Sherpa gets altitude sickness, take that as a sign and go home. The remaining porters and Sherpas made mistakes without Baig's experienced guiding hand. The first death happened at 8am on August 1st when a climber unclipped himself to attend to his oxygen system, lost his balance and fell to his death 100 metres below. Again, scared of heights, that is my, that is my worst nightmare. The only thing I'm scared of more is open water, so the only thing scary to me would be falling off the mountain, landing in like a big pool of water, and then seeing like the shadow of a shark or something. And then on like the nearby, I can see a lake and there's a spider on it, man. Why am I thinking about this? I'm gonna have nightmares tonight when I'm like sweating out the rest of his fever. What am I, I'm a fool, I'm a foolish fool. Moving swiftly on, a subsequent death was a porter who reportedly was experiencing motion sickness during rescue operations and slipped and fell to his death again. Following these two deaths, numerous climbers opted out of summiting K2, joining others who'd left right after Baig's exit. 18 climbers made it to the top of K2 that day, but the descent is where things became even more dangerous. And it's always the way. Uh, I believe there's a quote from some mountain climber somewhere. It's like, climbing is the easy part. It's getting down is the part they don't tell you about because no one ever talks about the climb down. It's always the ascent. And you always assume, well, once you've got up there, it must be just as easy to get back down. It's like, no, it's worse because now you don't even have the motivation of reaching the top to power through. It's just you're exhausted and you want to get home. It was getting darker as the climbers continued their descent. They were descending the bottleneck at 8.30 p.m. when a Serac broke off and took out the fixed lines, taking one of the climbers with it. Worst of all, the fall made the bottleneck far more technical and ultimately stranded the climbers with no fixed lines in the darkness. They were stuck in what is known as, as we mentioned earlier, the death zone due to the lack of oxygen at the high altitude, the weather, and the fact that if you are there and you need help, help is not coming. You are on your own. Worst nightmare. While some tried to descend, others chose to just hold up and wait until morning to see if things got better. The midnight descents resulted in several more deaths due to falls and ice sheets falling above the bottleneck. The tragedies continued as more people attempted to make it through the bottleneck. Still, the same fate met numerous climbers. Ice sheets fell and avalanches wiped them out, never to be seen again. The fourth ice sheet fall resulted in the deaths of five climbers at once, three from the South Korean team and two Nepalese Sherpas. Rescue efforts were made, but some bodies couldn't be retrieved and remained lost to the mountain. K2 wasn't attempted again for years following the disaster and it was only summited again in August 21st, 2011. Since then, things have changed with attempts to summit the mountain increasing in frequency each and every year. Thanks to a more consistent string of successful summits in recent years, people are questioning if K2's days a savage mountain may be coming to an end, allowing for it to become similar to Mount Everest, a thriving tourist attraction for climbers. And I guess we kind of have to mention, like, surely people have seen, like, there are literal queues to the summit of Everest. Also, fun fact, the summit of Mount Everest gets Wi-Fi, so you can take a selfie right at the top. Anyway, this story is still developing and the ramifications for the Himalayas could be quite huge. As the Himalayas already see the consequences of high foot traffic and demand growing by the year, overall K2 will likely experience some overflows of its activity, especially if it's becoming a more hospitable mountain to climb. The ecological effects that the mountain will undergo as a result, considering the already problematic issues over Mount Everest when it comes to feces and trash, remain to be seen. Why is, why is, why is the tallest mountain in the world like a holy place for Nepali people? 
covered in poop. <sighs> For now though, the fact remains that K2 is the deadliest mountain in the Himalayas, even if that title may be in debate. So I hope everybody found this video to be entertaining, educational and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things. And if you are inclined to agree, you can give the author James CJ some kudos over on their social media links provided below. I've been your host, Carl Smallwood. I've been very ill today. I apologise. Um, as mentioned, I am terrified of heights, though I'm not unfamiliar with the idea of climbing mountains. I'll grab the picture for the editor and I guess I'll tell the story now, because no one ever believes me when I tell this story, but Britain does have mountains. They're not big mountains. I don't think there's any above a thousand meters, but you know, they've got snow on top and stuff. And I legit accidentally walked up a mountain in the Lake District, I believe, because I always get the Lake District and the Peak District confused because the Lake District has peaks and the Peak District has lakes. It's weird, but you know, I was there with friends. We were looking for a pub and we were told it's just over that hill. And we just walked in a straight line and just after a while we noticed why is there like four foot of snow here oh we're at the top of a mountain there were people in like full mountaineering gear looking at us like dressed for a day at the pub and just the picture that i have is just me in skinny jeans at the top of the mountain like yay i did it i did it i did it by accident but i still did it and i'll try to that photo and i'll give it to the editor no one ever believes me they all think it's like photoshop it's like no i just walked up it by accident because it was just there and it happened. Then the next day, we actually tried to climb it legit. And we got stuck in about like snow that was like this deep. And I remember just the moment we said, F this is when a, a big like gust of wind came and nearly blew our friend, who's like five foot tall, clean into the air. And she had to like dive down into the snow to hold on. And we went, you know what? No pub's worth this. Let's just get a bottle of wine and head back to the cottage. But anyway. Hope everyone enjoyed this video. See you all next time. And as always, I like to say, go out there and have the day that you deserve. Cheers.